Welcome, welcome everybody to the official launch of my IGTV new series, Women Who Roar, which is going to feature culture shifters as well as female icons and women who just invigorate good energy to us. And I see my first guest, Soledad, who has requested me, so let me make sure to bring her. All right, I just uh, requested Soledad, so she's being connected. There you go! I'm so good. How are you? I am good. How funny is it that we are matching right now? I know. I like it. And you know, the I mean, crazy thing is I only have two outfits. So <laughs> I've run out of clothes tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for saving one of your outfits for me. <laughs> happily, happily, happily. Thanks I appreciate me. that. So you know, I am so honored to have you as my first guest on the launch of this series, Women Who Roar. And, you know, I launched this because I felt like I needed good energy, our community good needs good needs good energy, and we just need to be reminded of life and be reminded of positivity and just be reminded that we are all human, we are in this together. And that is why it is my true honor to have you on because Thank I have you. been a girl fan for years. I love it. Thank um, you. You're so nice. The first time I met you was I was um, an analyst at Lehman Brothers. I was fresh out of college. You came on, you sat in a panel. That was actually my first introduction to you. And I remember telling myself like, wow, this is a woman that I want to be like. I just <laughs> wanted to like embody your energy your assertiveness, your intellect. You were just super badass. And I was like, oh my God, this is this is the type of woman I need in my life, right? Love it. More, more. Don't stop. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you I told myself then, I said, I'm going to figure out how I'm gonna collaborate with this woman one day. And here we are, 15 we are. years I later. It. I love it, I love it, I love it. <laughs> 15 years later, and I run into you at an event at NASDAQ, and you were just so warm and so open and just so eager to collaborate and just help. And I just want to let course, you know how much course. I appreciate that. So thank it's you for being pleasure. here. Thank you for having me. Yes. So welcome, everybody. We are super pumped to have you. And this is a behind-the-scenes look. I mean, Soledad, you're in your house, right? I'm in my bedroom. You know, we've set up my bedroom as a studio. So we've been shooting our show. We do a Sunday morning show called Matter of Fact. We've been shooting it, and my kids are running the prompter. I'm working the camera. So I'm literally in my little studio, which is my bedroom. Same. I'm, I'm literally in front of my shoe rack. Oh, that's my <laughs> shoe rack. I like that. Thank you. So I'm, we're both in our bedrooms right now, creating studios <laughs> and making magic happen. So I was doing, of course, my homework on you, everything fully that. And I was like, I got to prepare for this because I have so many questions that I wanted to, that I want to ask you. And, and I wanted to start with your mom because I saw that you had a pinned tweet on your Twitter. And I was like, what is this about? Like, let me learn more about her mom. And it was just so powerful. She was the original badass, which I don't yes. think I appreciated when I was like 12 or 13. I mean, my full name is Maria de la Soledad Teresa Marchetti O'Brien, right? Just the Blessed Virgin Mary, which is not an easy name. I know, I know. As That's a middle that. schooler. I got a lot of consonants in that name. <laughs> but my mom was really, you know, she was tough and really um, a tough, classic kind of, I always think of like the classic immigrant woman, you know, just a hard worker, put her head down, wanted the best for her children, was willing to work to get there. Um, passed away. My mom died almost, uh, just almost exactly a year ago. Mm. And so, um, but she was very, very tough. And I always appreciated that she was willing to fight for the things that really mattered. That pinned tweet is about my mom fighting for um, access to housing. Where I grew up in Long Island, uh, they were able to not sell houses. In fact, when I was a kid, we couldn't get anybody to sell us a house because my mom's black and my dad is white. Mm. And so if you didn't want people in your community, you, you actually could discriminate against them very openly. And so my mom long pushed to kind of open up housing to minorities in Long Island uh, and, and met with a lot of resistance. People didn't really, you know, didn't really support that yeah. and didn't want to do it. Um, and she, and so she has this great, you know, art, kind of like she took out an ad, I think, but she, I found it among her things when she passed away where she basically is in no uncertain terms calling out the uh, supervisor 
of uh, Suffolk County supervisor. Mm -hmm. And I just loved it because, you know, like she just fought for the things that mattered. And I think, you know, I mean, imagine being one of a very small handful of black people in our community and taking out an ad to do that. Like talk about a risk, you know? So yeah. it makes me always feel like anything that I do, there's no risk involved, you know? There, there, that was a real risk. And I, I just, I think she's just awesome. I really, I really miss her because she just was completely, um, tough on things and yeah. you know she believed a thing she believed a thing and she didn't kind of waffle and yeah, not, not that many people are like that no unfortunately not and that's why I admire women like you because you remind me when I'm feeling challenged or when I'm feeling motivation is low when I'm feeling like something's too risky I look at careers like yours and I'm like Solida is out there. I can do this. She's doing this. She looks like me. She talks like me. You know, she cares about diversity. Um, I can do this because I see the example in front of me. So thank you. And I see how your mother well, we can both thank you. Mother. And that was, someone asked where in Long Island. It was Smithtown, Long Island. She was talking about the Suffolk County supervisor. Uh, I grew up in Smithtown, Long Island. Yeah. And then your dad, interestingly enough, is Australian mm -hmm. of Irish descent, which I also didn't know, which I thought was really interesting. Hence the O'Brien. Yeah. Yes. My maiden name. I'm an O'Brien. My maiden name is O'Brien. So my dad's family is from Australia through Ireland. They, they went from Ireland, um, or I should say Australia via Ireland. They came from Ireland to Australia. Yeah, yeah. And just your family is just powerful. Your siblings all went to Harvard, just like you. Yeah, but you know, let me, uh, it, which was a great place to go to school and is amazing, but there's a million great places to get an education and never, ever, ever buy the spin that somehow someone is better in any way just because they went to a bold face name school. I know because I went to one, a lot of smart people, a lot of brilliant people, and a lot of everybody else too, right? And every school is like that. And I really want students to know, I had great friends who are far smarter than I was in high school, who for financial reasons, maybe couldn't go to the school that they wanted to go to, um, or just decided they didn't want to be far from home for whatever reason. There's so many great schools. So yes, Harvard was a great place to go to school. And all my siblings did go in some capacity, the law school, the medical school, fantastic education. The great thing in America is we are surrounded by fabulous institutions of learning, and there are many places to go to get a great education. Yeah, I want to talk about that a little bit further, because I think right now, given the time, we have a great opportunity to really self-reflect and think about how we want to show up in the world, the legacy we want to leave behind, and just really stepping into our own skin and being comfortable in that. There was actually a quote that I had read from an article that you were in that I loved. And I was like, oh my God, I got to ask her about this. So here's the quote. You owe it to yourself to forgive, to figure out who you are and know who you are, but you don't owe it to anyone else to explain it or defend it. Yeah. And I thought that was powerful. And I think for a lot of people of color, right, you are often going to be in spaces where you're either going to be talking about things, defending things, explaining things, and it can get pretty exhausting. And so I do, I think that there's something really fun about figuring out who you are. I'm 53 now, and I'd say only in the last couple of years have I felt super Cheers comfortable. You, darling. Right, I have my glass one, I left it in the other room. Um, <laughs> really, like, you know, there's something great about sort of being like, you know, this is what I like, and this is what I don't like. These right. are the people I wanna be with, and these are the people I don't wanna be with. It's a really, I'd say I got there around 50, of like, you know what? This is what I want to do. Yeah. But you don't, you know, anybody who's mixed race, certainly, and a whole bunch of other people get a lot of like, well, what are you? And who are you? And can I touch your hair? And I'm like, you know, and I, I think there are times when I feel like explaining things to people, but there's a lot of times when I don't. Yeah. And so I don't, if I don't feel like it. And you don't, you don't owe it to anybody. Um, when I realized that other people's issues about me were, were not my issues, you know, someone's, well, I just don't understand, multiracial, can you explain, are you this, are you that? It's like, this is obviously your issue. It's not my issue. Right. But ergo, I don't have to take it on. I don't have to wear it like a little backpack of all your drama around me. I, yeah. I don't have any. And so I'm not, I'm like, I'm not carrying it. I'm giving it right on back to you. And that was a very, I would just advise people who are younger than me, don't wait till you're 50 to figure that out. Figure right. that out. Yeah, yeah. Did it take you until you were in your 50s to figure that out? I didn't grapple with it. It wasn't a negative thing. It was just one of those things where one day you're very free to like, oh, I don't need to tackle this shit. This is like absolutely not. Like, yes. It's not mine. I can sidestep it. 
Yes. Um, and you know, you don't have to jump into every argument. You don't have to explain everything. When someone says, you know, well, what are you? You actually don't owe someone a long involved explanation if you don't want to give one. Definitely. And I do think it took me um, probably till 50 to just be like, eh, I don't care. Yeah. I really kind of, it really dawned on me like, oh, it's not, they're not really asking me for me because I'm confusing. They're confused. It's really all yes. about them. So I don't, I don't have to do anything if I don't want to. Definitely. Whew. That's gems right there. Gems. Um, so I'm sorry, but I am distracted by this artwork behind you. What is this? <laughs> great. So yes, it's, it's amazing. This is an elephant, and it's done by a beautiful Cuban artist um, whose name I can't remember at this moment. But, you know, one of the big challenges in Cuba, I was there shooting a story the other day, because the U.S. is clamped down, and now, obviously, with coronavirus, uh, it, cruise ships generally are, uh, no one should be getting on a cruise ship at this moment with coronavirus yeah. happening globally. But before that, cruise ships were not allowed, if they were going to come to Cuba, they couldn't go to the United States as well. So that meant that a lot of artists were really suddenly struggling. They had set up these beautiful, almost massive multi-floor studios where the artisans could show off their beautiful work. And now nobody would come through these massive buildings that used to have literally a, you know, thousands of tourists walking through. And so I met an artist um, when I was shooting the story, and I love this elephant because he described it as elephants have all this beauty and no matter what's happening around them, they just keep marching forward. I mean, it's such a great lesson, right? Like, you know what? They're quiet, they put their heads down, and they just keep moving forward to get to what they need to get to. And I just thought that was a really amazing message. Definitely, and I think it's a prime example of your career and your story, right? Because after CNN, you completely transformed and became your own boss had your own production company, and now, you know, you have this new life that you are brewing and that you are living, you know, in your truth every day and doing it on your own. How does that feel? How did that transition happen? I loved it. It, we, I, I started my company about seven years ago, and I'd say the first year, year and a half were hard because I really didn't know how to run a business. Mm -hmm. I had no training. Uh, I didn't have no accounting uh, training. You know, so the actual, like, how do you run a business Sure, you can declare yourself CEO, but, you know, are you actually running a business? And I realized, actually, one really fun thing about trying something completely different, I'm pretty good at it. And, and, and you know, <laughs> yeah. I just need to listen. And I, if I weren't, I would be like, I'm really bad at it because like, yeah. like, it didn't matter to me to, I don't mind admitting what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. But I was pleasantly surprised that I was good at negotiating deals and that I was good at sort of sitting down with um buyers and try to explain to them what we were interested in doing and that's been really fun it's a very different muscle for me I've anchored forever out in the field I love it I love going live I love doing tape I love doing documentaries all that stuff I could mm -hmm. do in my sleep this is a little bit different to run a company was kind of a whole different thing and I think for the first year and a half I was like well, I'm the CEO I mean I felt like <laughs> a little right, right, right. because what does that even mean right, but it's been yeah. a great experience and I think the best thing has been one, you really get to shape a company the way you want to. Like, what do you want? What do you want the values to be? You know, what do you want it to look like? What do you want, what do you want on the walls? Who do you want to come through the door? What do you yeah. want it to feel like? What time does it start? What time do, you know, when does everyone go home? But also, who do you work with? You know, like, I really, we pretty early on created, like, we just don't have jerks. I just don't do it. And there's no one who I'm willing to work with if they're unpleasant. Just won't do it. Yeah, literally. Yeah. Absolutely not. And that's been kind of a pleasant thing to sort of say, you know, nope, nope, nobody, nope. <laughs> and yeah. you know, I'm going to work with people I like. And yeah. and that I think that's been the most exciting thing to just kind of pick. Like, if I like someone, we'll be doing a project together one day, we'll just figure it out because I, we like each other. Yeah. And people who no matter how much money is on the table, or no matter how, you know, how important the project might be, if, if I don't want to work with them, we just don't do it. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, one of the main reasons why I wanted to have you on is because you have such a fruitful, vibrant career, there's so much knowledge to share. And I think right now is a really good time for us to kind of get our armor ready and learn as much as we can, absorb as much as we can. And I'm hosting a webinar tomorrow that 
is going to teach people how to negotiate contracts actually and become a consultant and get these six figure deals because it's out there. And well, here's the interesting thing I learned. When I worked in, in, in news and you know, you have an agent and everything's negotiating, it basically works like this. What are you gonna get paid? Yep. How many weeks of vacation? Okay, so they're gonna pay you a dollar. I think I can get them to a dollar 25. They're offering three weeks of vacation. I'm pretty yep. sure I can get them to four. When I started running my own company, you really would go in and say, like, well, what do you need out of this deal? Right? right. And what I would find sometimes when I would hire people, they'd say, well, my, my kid, you know, is likes ballet. And I really would like to have every other Friday off. And I'm like, okay, if I want, if I want that person, okay, here's yeah. how we work it out. Right. And I was amazed at how, I mean, that was what got fun about doing deals that it wasn't just, okay, we can negotiate on the money or the vacation time. It was like, how do we make this work? How, yeah. how I want to do it. You want to do it. We like each other. Okay. What do we need to do to, to make this work? And solve it's a solving a problem right it's right. it's there's a puzzle and we need to just kind of figure out the puzzle and I really enjoyed the idea of solving problems and so I often will tell people when you go into negotiate you know don't just think about like a box here's the box and everything you know I, my assistant works from home she was commuting four hours a day an amazing assistant I was like you should not be commuting That's if you can do, if you can do the job from home, just be home. Yeah. And, and you know what? She's amazing. Actually, she's even better when she's not exhausted and frustrated from driving yeah. into New York City. And yeah. so, I, you know, I think she felt like, well, I'll never be able to, you know, how could I do an assistant job from home? Well, you can. You just have to kind of figure out the ground rules and figure out how to make it work. So yeah. I always tell people, like, don't be limited by this sense of, well, it'll never work. Everything can be on the table if you want it to be. Right. Right. Just be, I think people go into negotiations or any type of difficult conversation thinking it's a win-lose situation, but actually, you know, business, it's beneficial most when both sides are winning because both sides have real skin in the game and actually want it to work. And what is, what's on the table, right? Like right. this idea, like everything is not money. For right. the woman who had a daughter in ballet, like getting paid another $10 an hour or whatever, you know, at the end, or $10 a week, you know, was not valuable to her. She, you know, she, here, yeah. what she wanted was to be able to go see her daughter do ballet. That, right. that translated into money for her. So this idea that we think about, well, what's the salary? You know, it's, it's just open your mind to a bigger conversation that could bring everybody to a yes, because as you say, right, that conversation doesn't have to be a win-lose. It can be a, right. everybody wins. Definitely, definitely. So what would you get? What advice would you offer folks? Because as I said, we're in a time of reinvention, we're in a time of people thinking they can no longer depend on their nine to five, they want to do their own thing, multiple streams of income, all of that stuff. What is your advice for folks who are just starting? What did you wish you knew, I guess, when you first started, um, that you can offer to folks to think about now? Uh, I think just hard work is sometimes underrated. You know, I really hire people that are just good hard workers. And everybody wants to know, like, hey, are you an influencer? And is this? And, that? and sometimes it's like, you know what? I just come in, I do the work, and I do it well. That's a really big plus that I don't think people brag enough about. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, I wish when I was starting my own company, if I knew um, that I was going to start a company, I really would have taken accounting classes, just basic accounting classes, because we, our very first budget was a terrible budget. And I let other people do it because I was like, well, you know, I don't know how to do a budget. I don't do budgets. I, you know, and you realize like, oh my goodness, this was a horrible budget. I, I certainly could have done a terrible budget just like this one. <laughs> right, right, and, right. And by the way, it's my money. So now yeah. it's a bad budget. It's terrible. And it's my cash. So I really, from that moment on, I never, ever had another budget go by that I did not write. And I'm like, yeah. if it's terrible, at least I can say it's my own dumb fault versus yeah. it's terrible and I wasn't paying attention to it. Yes, yeah. yes. Super important. And I think women in particular, we tend to leave the number stuff for other people and don't do it ourselves and practice ourselves. And in business, you need to know your numbers. You need to know your books. You need to know what's going you know what on. What the worst is, a girlfriend of mine once said, you know, because what you'll find when you have a small business is everyone wants to meet with you, right? Can you yeah. meet? Can you meet? And people will meet you to death. Absolutely. But she said, you know, you have to actually figure out what's your time worth. You know, so you go into these meetings, say, well, if my time is worth a hundred dollars an hour, is it worth it for me to now have the third lunch with this person? Definitely. Right? Yeah. Is it worth it now that we're going to have six meetings 
that have led to no business whatsoever. If they're fun and it's awesome and it's enjoyable, go for it. But if you think you're closing a deal and they don't think they're closing a deal at all and they just keep meeting with you, once you attach numbers to it, you begin to really see what the value is. Definitely. And I think that, that what you're saying is exactly right. Everybody has to really recognize kind of what the cost is. Yes, the opportunity cost of your time. Because if you're spending time Absolutely. like coffee, instead of spending time on the phone with a potential client, you know, well, that's your that, opportunity I, I, cost. I remember thinking sometimes spending time doing math homework with somebody, right? Like it's a, it's a zero sum game. If you're over here doing this, you're not over here doing that. So we right. got to a point where I would say, listen, you know, we do two meetings and that's it. After two meetings, I don't meet with people. And if they still want to be in business or still want to talk, you know, then they're now talking to other people on the team. But what I can't do is just do FaceTime with people over and over and over again while they decide what they want to do. And really coming up with sort of the financial structure of what's going to make you successful, I think understanding that was really important. Yeah. So two more questions before I let you go, because I know it's us and dinner right now. <laughs> um, I actually, we're having, we're having um, black beans and rice today and also mm -hmm. and chicken. So I'm, uh, I'm all over that. Yummy. So first, shout out to everybody in here. We really appreciate you guys chiming in and uh, commenting. But my question, my next question is around, you've covered some pretty dramatic stories. Um, you know, tsunamis, Colorado shooting, and you've been in positions where you've had to work in high anxiety situations, high pressure, a lot of sadness, which I think a lot of us are experiencing right now. And so I would love for you to share with us, how did you manage that? How did you manage that emotional weight? And, and, and how can folks manage their own emotional weight right now as we all kind of go through this virus together? You know, I think the first thing, it's very easy when you're a reporter to suddenly make yourself the story, right? It's hard and, and, and you have to look around and say, okay, I'm fine. You know, like, let's ground ourselves in reality. And I think that's the same thing at this time, right? Like, all right, what's the real assessment? Do we have housing? Do we, uh, is everybody healthy? You know, how are we really doing, number one? Because sometimes it's scary and it's realistically scary. It's scary because scary stuff is happening. But sometimes it's scary because you're being dramatic and certain things are actually okay at this moment. Yeah. My, I find my solace, and I give people this advice all the time, I am a list maker. I am a Virgo and Virgos are list makers and I am a list maker, which means every morning I start with what I have to get done. I have a giant list right over there like that you are on this list and I yes, go my list you. and make sure that I accomplish everything that I need to accomplish yeah. and I don't forget anything. And I really get done what I need to get done. And so I think what keeps me sane and kind of on track is this idea of a list. And a list will never lie to you. A list will tell you what you're getting done and what you're not getting done, you know, and, and where your values are. You can't say, mm -hmm. oh, my gosh, I really need to work out every day and literally never have workout on your list. So I think for me, a list is everything. Do, your, do you do your list the night before, the morning of? Depends. Um, sometimes the night before, like I'll, I, right now I've been, you know, staying up pretty late for me. So I'll stay up till like 1130 watching crappy TV. And um, <laughs> it's like, partly because everybody's gone to bed. I kind of have the house to myself. I have right. a one. I'm just That's kind of like, silence, you know, quiet. Silences. My husband goes to bed very early because he gets up very early. And so I will, um, I'll do my list then. And sometimes, and, and then I now, now that we're kind of all at home, I'll start my morning right off of my list that I did the night before. Occasionally, usually in New York City, I get up in the morning and I do my list because I get up pretty early. I probably get up at five o'clock in the morning. And so I'll get up and do my list in the morning. But at this time, because I'm staying up late, I sort of do my list the night before. Yeah, okay. Um, and so what I'm hearing is one of the ways to deal with the emotional weight is routine and to get your list together, have your schedule, know what you're doing the next day. Deal with the facts. Live right? in limbo. It's just like exactly. reporting. Deal with what's in front of you. I have a girlfriend who's very stressed about loans and finance. I'm like, well, but, you know, how much money are we talking about? And she doesn't know. Well, step one. No, whatever right. the we'll find out how much number money you're is. About. Right. What, what's the number? Because right. it's really hard to come up with a strategy if you don't have a number that's a realistic number. I guess I just always say, you know, deal in realism. Deal with what's there. A list will tell you, like, oh, crap, I have 28 things on my list. Woo, today is going to be a mess. So that when a girlfriend calls and wants to just hang out, you're like, nope, not today. Right. <laughs> you're today, not on the list. Back to back to back. We can't do it. And, and it really just keeps you honest about, you know, kind of making your day work. Yeah, totally.
So this last question I want to ask every guest that I have on this series. Um, and it's very much aligned with the theme. And I would love to know why you are a woman who roars. I think I'm a woman who roars because there's no upside in being quiet. It doesn't pay. Yes. I had a yes. nice invitation the other day to, to do an interview with a, a, a news organization. And the producer said something like, you know, I just, I'm just going to go out on a limb and invite you to do it. And I remember thinking like, but of course. And she said, you know, I'm just, I just am putting myself out there. And I, and I said, you always should. Like the lesson is, first of all, honored to do it, happy to do it, willing to do it. But also, why not? There's no, no one will ever, when you come to the realization that no one's ever going to come and pat you on the head and say, hey, I've noticed you toiling away over here. Woo, good for you. I'm going to give you a raise in that corner office because I just have really been admiring the work. It doesn't right. work like that. I wish right. it did. I really wish it did. It does not. Right. You yeah, have to I'm sit there it. and say, hey, I'm doing a good job. I'd like a raise. Hey, I'm doing a good job. I'd like a raise. Hey, I want you to know that somebody else has offered me another job. I'd rather stay here. But that other job is paying me more money and gives me different opportunity. What do you want to do? Right? It's, yes. I just don't see a win in this quiet, non-roaring personality. And roaring doesn't mean you have to be a bitch. Roaring can just be speaking up for what you want and what you deserve. And to say to someone, I'd like to do X. What do I need to do to get there? Is a yes. very fair question. Mm -hmm. I think Definitely. it's a really reasonable thing to ask. Definitely. Sometimes we just need to be honest with ourselves and those around, and just ask for what we want. <laughs> and by the way, someone's going to give you an answer that's going to reveal a lot, right? Either they're going to say, hey, you need to do these three things. We'd love to have you. Or they'll say, there's nothing you could do because we don't actually think you could. Do. That happened to me once at a, when I was in local news in San Francisco. I wanted to anchor. And my boss is like, I have enough female anchors. You can't anchor here. I was like, okay. Good to know. You know what? And I took a job at MSNBC was launching. It was 1996. And I left because, and I appreciated the honesty, right? Mm -hmm. Like he didn't string me along. He just said, this is where your learning is going to end. You're doing this and we like you fine, but it's going to be this. Right. If you want to go someplace to do something, you know, he basically said, if you want to do that, don't stay here. Okay. Good to know. Right. So I think, again, you know, it's about realism. I, I appreciate knowing. I'd rather know. I want to know the terrible, scary number. I want to know the tons of work that I have to do for the next day. And I want to know, does somebody want me in this office or not? And if they don't, it's okay. Let's come up with a strategy to go do something else with people who want to be with you. Yeah. Somebody said most people can't handle the roar. You'd be surprised. I think the roar is sometimes perceived as mean and nasty. The roar doesn't have to be mean. The roar can just be straightforward. Right, right, right. right? To me, I think the roar is often, I, I even said this to my assistant. I was like, you are miserable commuting four hours a day. So let's talk about working from home. I think that was a roar, right? I, I had to say it for her. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to try it. We're going to try it for two months. Here's what I'm going to need you to do. Here's what I need out of this. I need to be able to reach you at any time. I need, if you're going to go to the doctor or go to yoga class or go to whatever, I need to know right. that you're gone. And I need you to not work 12 hours a day, right? right. Working from home doesn't mean you're going to be chained to your desk. Right. And he's like, okay, well, here's what I need. <laughs> and it has worked out perfectly. So I think roaring is about straightforward conversations about what do you need? What do I need? And how do we do this together? Right, definitely. And I think that's a great way to end the first official episode of my IGTV series, Women Who Roar. Thank you so much, Soledad. Thank I you for having you. My vessels, all that good stuff. Thank you for being the woman who you are. Thank you for the soul that you have. And thank you for just being, just having the ultimate humility at this time and just keeping us also informed and doing what you do, giving it to us straight with no chaser. I Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> nice All right. Enjoy your dinner. Have a great night. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.